Welcome to Let's Talk Love. Today I'm sharing the hour with Sean Galanos, who is a tremendous love coach and master communicator. It was such a pleasure talking with him about emotional availability. How do we show up in relationship? How can we be vulnerable and clear all while being loving? I think it's a challenge we all face in our lives. Sean reminds us to ask for what we want in our relationships. We talk about the cautions of oversharing, what red flags really mean, and what to look out for in others who may not be emotionally available. This is a conversation I am so happy to have had. Enjoy. I am excited to have our guest, somebody who I admire and have worked with a number of occasions, Sean Galanos. Sean, thank you so for joining ha- us. So happy to be here. You've got a great uh, podcast voice. You know, I was always told growing up that I've got a radio voice. I could do, um, what do you call it, voiceovers? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know what? This could be my next calling, but the podcast works for now. As long as they don't say <laughs> that you have a face for radio, that's not a compliment. <laughs> I think you have an excellent voice for podcasting too. It's mo- sure mainly you, You've been told that your whole life, haven't you, Sean? <laughs> so, no, not my whole life, but someone said that, I, that they love my sweet, dulcet tones. Yes. The microphone helps a lot. Yeah. So, Sean, you are a love coach. You're the host of the Love Drive podcast and an online course creator. You've created so many courses, and you're going to be telling us about your new course, The Love Collective, at the end, which I'm very excited. I read your newsletter this morning, and I thought, that's fantastic. Love it. You teach valuable, very valuable intimacy and communication tools for better relationships and more love. And when I think about learning communication, it's your, you that come up. And because you are an excellent teacher, and it's very clear, it's direct, and it's also loving. So yeah, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can combine all of those in one thing and communicate in a loving way. <laughs> I mean, that is, that is the, that's the gold standard, right? If you could be clear, really direct, and, and kind at the same time. Oftentimes, there's yeah. one of those key pieces missing. And then it you so know, comes out a little that harsh. I, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's okay. Something that I've um, started doing as of last week when I interviewed Esther Peral and Dr. Solomon was this asking this question. And it's going to be the question now that everybody's being asked. And I'm sorry I didn't give you the heads up, but it's not a hard okay. one. I'm ready for it. What is giving you the greatest joy right now in your life? And what is a challenge that you're working through? Wow. Um, greatest joy is that I finally found a place to live that is my yeah. own. Yeah. I moved to, to Arizona of all places. I, I really didn't think I would end up here. This was not on the list, you know, but I drove through Flagstaff and I really liked it. And, um, and I found a place to live and, and I haven't had my own space in over a year. So when I left Montreal, I'd been sort of on the road looking for, you know, the, the next place to call home. And I finally found it. And then it was, you know, a rental and an Airbnb and a hotel. And, and I finally found a place to live. So um, nesting, I'm a big nester. I love creating home spaces. So this is what's giving me a lot of joy right now. And then uh, similarly, the same thing actually is giving me a lot of challenge. Hmm. Right, moving to a new place, meeting new yep. people, building community, uh, dealing with the the weather, the climate considerations. Right, there is no perfect place to live. There is no perfect relationship. There is no perfect job. Right, I, I really believe that that we can never really attain perfection. And people say, you know, perfection is the what is it the 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 killer of good or something, or, you know, it prevents you from just being happy with what you have because you're always looking for more. And so a lot of these things that bring us joy or bring me joy are also things that challenge me at the same time. And I think that's, that is so similar. It's such a parallel, like you just mentioned about relationships with people, because you can look at all of the strengths and beauty and, um, all, like, like I said, all those things that you love about a person. And then if you're identifying the weaknesses that you think in that person, things that really bother you, they're almost on the same, it's like the same thing flipped. 
It's like that, that thing you love about that person over, let's say, five, six years. It doesn't matter how long you're with somebody. It's like all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't like that about them. Well, it's actually the same <laughs> thing that you fell in love with them about them. And now it's becoming something like a thorn. That's super common. Super yes. common. The thing that you that draws you to the person sometimes can be the thing that pushes you away from the person, Mm -hmm. right? Like I I remember an old relationship with a woman who was, you know, free spirit and that was kind of alluring and exciting. And, you know, Mm -hmm. she was a little aloof and had a hard time committing. And I was like, Ooh, a challenge. And then when we got into a relationship, that is the thing that sort of drove me crazy. The fact that she was still having a hard time committing and was being aloof and, and a free spirit. And I was like, well, we can't build anything sustainable, you know, with this kind of dynamic. So it was the thing that attracted me to her. It was also the thing that sort of pushed me away. Wow. We're going to get into that because I think that relates to the topic of red flags. But that's not a red flag. And that's what you teach. So... You created a brilliant online course. And of course, you are a content creator, an online course creator. And you do yeah. live lessons as well, live classes. Like yeah. we're going to talk about at the end with your newest one. So our team took the emotional availability course that you've Love created. It. Love it. It's called Open Up to Love. And it's a three-part online course. And it's for anyone that wants to develop their own emotional availability and how to recognize it or the lack thereof in others, right? Yeah. So I would just love to know some history on why you created the course, walk us through your career up to that point, and then what prompted you to create this emotional availability course? Wow. Well, uh, I guess just a real primer on how I got to do this work is that I, like seven, eight, nine years ago maybe at this point, I was driving a taxi cab in San Francisco, hadn't done anything love-related, wasn't doing anything online, and... Uh, started recording my conversations with my passengers about I love that story, you know, sex, love and dating. Yeah. And that's where the love drive came from literally yeah. driving, talking about love. And then uh, th- over the years, I sort of stopped driving a cab, but then I started writing and, and writing blog posts, making videos and the podcast. And then I got certified as a coach because I needed some sort of training. I also have a background mm-hmm. in uh, communication. So it sort of makes sense that a lot of my stuff is based on communication. Yes. So then I started coaching people privately. And then I was like, well, I, I kind of want to do courses. You know, I want to be able to reach more people. Mm-hmm. And so I started developing these courses, uh, healthy communication, getting your needs met. And then this one topic that kept coming back up over and over and over again was emotional availability. And a couple of years ago, I think that's when like, the term emotional availability really peaked, you know, mm-hmm. like people were sort of frenzied around. I think now it's, it's more like attachment styles and attachment theory. and narcissism and yeah, and narcissism. <laughs> yeah. And avoiding narcs and that whole thing. Yeah. Um, but emotional availability and emotional intelligence is, you know, it's important. It's, it's yes. kind of, kind of crucial <laughs> in some relationships, right? Not, not everyone's going to want the kind of relationship where you touch really deep, intimate vulnerabilities, right? And that's fine. You could have yeah. something that's more casual or you can have, uh, I don't want to call them more surface level, but they just don't go as deep. But I also found that a lot of women were complaining that their partners weren't emotionally available. Oftentimes they're male partners. Mm-hmm. So I started looking into this stuff and, and started, you know, throwing some theories around. One of them is that like, you know, if, um, if you're always attracting or in relationship with emotional available, uh, emotionally unavailable people, there is maybe some part of you that is also emotionally unavailable. Yeah. Right. Because if you choose those partners subconsciously, unconsciously, or even consciously, you are protecting yourself from having to go deep because you've picked because you're someone with to go somebody in. that doesn't want to. Yes. That actually yeah, it makes doesn't perfect go, sense. And then, and then you can blame it on them. You can say, oh, you're, you just don't open yep. up. <laughs> Which we tend to do. <laughs> you just don't open up. You know, I'm trying to get you to open up and you just don't open up. And, and it's, you know, that's fairly common. So that's why I wanted to create, create the course and to explore what are these parts of us that we are scared of showing others? How can we identify people who might be emotionally available, which, by the way, is super hard to do, like in the yes. beginning stages of a relationship. You really yeah. can't really predict who, there are some indicators, and we can talk about that later. But um, and then how, you know, how to open up, how to identify people. Some people, you know, at the very beginning, will present as they will appear mm-hmm. to be emotionally available, 
right? Folks that love bomb or that come on real strong or that love the full court press and will sort of like pay you a whole bunch of compliments and appear to be emotionally available. And then, you know, come to find out they're, they're actually pretty shut down. And then the other folks who might appear shut down are probably just taking their time. You know, they, they don't open up to everybody right away, which I think is a really good thing to do. I don't think you should open up right away. So those folks who might appear shut down could actually be, you know, some of the most uh, emotionally intelligent folks that you could be in a relationship with. I love that point. So can you give us your definition of emotional availability? You have in your course, this definition from one of your lovebirds. Yeah. Leslie. And it's an excellent quote, but it's really long, but I would just like to hear in your words, what is your definition of emotional availability? Yeah, I think I think uh, if we were to paraphrase, it's something along the lines of being able to access a wide range of emotional experiences and to sit with other people's emotional experiences, right? That's sort of the, the, yes. the short version of it. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's really, all that's it. it. It's like if you're, if you're in a place of, I'm feeling really scared right now, Actually, I think about that. It's like, do I ever really express those words? But it's like, you know, I'm easy. I'm easily able to express joy and um, honesty and vulnerability. But if I think about by being vulnerable, if I was to say I'm scared, that's me being vulnerable. Yeah. 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 So, so being able to uh, identify a wide range of emotions. You know, I yeah. remember... Uh, in my early 20s, I was in couples counseling with my par- partner, girlfriend at the time. And uh, we just, we I think we were together four years in total. But after the first year, we had just like some massive incompatibility in terms of resolving conflict. We just didn't, I didn't have the tools. I mean, I was like 21 years old. I didn't have the tools and she didn't have the tools either. And so we were just kept butting heads. So we, we found ourselves in couples counseling at 22, which is, isn't a red flag. It's just like, I think it's actually kind of beautiful that two young folks would, would want to go through that journey, you know, of therapy together. Yeah. And what what I found out is that I had a real inability to access anything other than like anger or blind rage. Mm -hmm. Right. I didn't have the spectrum at all. There was no nuance between, you know, mildly annoyed, miffed, upset, you know, there's steps before you get to blind rage. And I would just go from fine to super angry. Yeah. And so over those years, I've been able to sort of fine tune the radar and to get more in tune with what's going on. What am I feeling? Why am I feeling this? Why is this here? What is it trying to tell me? Right. So these are all parts of becoming more available is is becoming more curious about what it is that's coming up for you. Yeah. So you list off the traits, like there's obviously there's a lot um, that comes with being emotionally available. You list off being able to be vulnerable, transparent, honest, reliable, generous, willing to compromise. That's important. (laughs) Know when to show up. Know some of your weaknesses. I think that one is important. Like identifying your weaknesses. Ooh, Like we get that question asked, you know, in interviews when you're younger. It's a hard yeah, one, right? You're like, oh, I'm I'm a too too I'm hard. I'm a perfectionist, a worker. or <laughs> yeah, I, <right. laughs> yeah, like what? I'm lazy, and sometimes I'm lazy. Sometimes I take a nap under my desk. That's not good for getting hired. Do never ever admit that, right? Um, so maybe no, do it after you, you get hired. And take responsibility. That's really important, and you're yeah. willing to do the work. That's yeah. also, I think, very critical in a partnership. Yeah, consistent and stable. The one thing I did want to talk to you about, which you just mentioned earlier, was about transparency. Because transparency is a part of, like, uh, it is listed as one of the things that would demonstrate emotional availability. Yeah. And I think there's differing ideas about what transparency, the importance of transparency, and what actually, I would love to hear your idea about what that means and the importance of it in a relationship. Because it's like, like you said earlier, you don't want to be... 100% 100% transparent with somebody you don't know, obviously. Yeah. Like when you meet yeah. somebody, and I think, I know I've been guilty of this in new relationships when I was younger. It's like, if I think if I tell this person everything about myself, I'm being honest. I'm, yeah. I am being honest, but I'm also big time oversharing. And it's a boundary violation on myself 
And that other person doesn't freaking know me. Yeah, they didn't ask for all that. Yeah. I call it puking on someone's shoes. Yes. Where you just sort of just, you just yes. unload on, on people. And, I, you know, I think people that overshare, you know, I think it's, it's sort of vir- virtuous in some degree. Like they, they, they want to be transparent. They just don't know how to modulate that. Yeah. Um, or also it could also be, you know, some attempt at getting someone to like them. Um, if what they're sharing is positive. And then the other side of that is when you basically say everything that you're thinking. Oh, that's, you know, you're right, that right. That's another, not, like, that's way too transparent. Yeah. Not, and you can't, you don't want to be mean, no. right? But, the, but there has to be, it, it's all, uh, so, sort of all going back to, you know, direct, honest and kind communication. So, right? so one, sh- one of my lessons around vul- transparency was, I know that there, where the, where the uh, root of it all was, I was raised Catholic yeah. and growing up to learn from a very, very young age, like it's all about honesty and telling the truth. And it's like, somebody asked me a question, I'm going to answer it forthright, but sometimes it's too much information or it's like I, that person didn't deserve the answer. Like, I don't know yeah. you. Like if I'm dating yeah. somebody and you're asking me a question, I would just answer, right? Yeah. <laughs> because I want to be honest and truthful. Yeah. However, like, and then I think if I'm not being honest, I'm telling a lie. Right. Or withholding information is a lie or something. It's like, so I'm just saying this, like these belief systems that we can be raised with that aren't in our best interest. Um, and, and what about this? It's like, even if you are with somebody, which I am, like I'm, I'm married, I don't need to know about my husband's ex-partner's. He could be transparent with me if I asked him. I know he would be, but I'm saying like, there's a limit. Like you want to be able to protect yourself. And it's like, they don't need to know everything. You can also have that other side of you that's just yours, right? Yeah. Well, you also, I mean, you, you just spoke to Esther Perel or es- Esther Perel uh, recently and, you know, uh, mating in captivity, right? Fire needs air. So yes. there has to be some amount of mystery in yes. your relationship, which will keep that fire going, right? If, if you share everything about everything that you're thinking, everything that you want, everything, and they do the same thing, well, then you are creating a really safe space. Uh, but you're also sort of uh, creating something that is so safe that it's, a, you know, it's a bit, uh, it lacks passion, mm. right? So there, yes. there's, okay. there's yeah, a case that's... to be made for being a little bit mysterious or not knowing everything about your ex, your, your, your partner's past or not even knowing everything that your partner is doing, right? Like they have plans on the weekend. You say, cool, have a great weekend, you know, and you trust mm. them not to cheat. But then there's like a little thing inside. Like, like know. could, could <laughs> they, could, could they, 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 they could, I guess they could. I didn't ask them what they were doing, so I don't know. So they could. And that is sort of something that can keep that fire going. So, you know, all that being said, there is an incredible amount of nuance that comes into play mm-hmm. when you're trying to figure out what do I say, what do I share, what do I ask. You know, one of the things that I, that I was just thinking about is like, do you need to know how many partners your ex, your, your, your how many how many, you know, partners your your partner has had sexual? Partners? Oh my gosh. I- that is something that I think early on in relationships, people are asking. <laughs> I, I know I've been asked that many times when I was like, you know, boyfriend, girlfriends growing up and whatever yeah. until I got married for the first time. And you know what? You they do not tell the answer. That other person actually doesn't want to know. And I didn't want to know either. Why did I ask the question? It's so ridiculous. Yeah, why did you ask the question? Why did I ask the question? It's like, and then you're like sitting there going, I didn't like that answer. <laughs> well, so one way to, one way you know, one way to deal with questions like that is say, look, I'm happy to tell you, but I'm kind of curious, like, why are you asking? Why do you want to know? And and, great answer, you know, (laughs) because you're not answering the question, you're answering the question with a question. (laughs) Yeah. Like if the number is higher than you want it to be, like, how is that going to impact our relationship? Right. So you can, you can get curious around the things that you may or may not want to talk about. I really like that. So one of our community questions is what is the difference between vulnerability and emotional availability. I don't, I don't, I think, I mean, I think, I think they're, they're, it's, it's yeah. part of being vulnerable is being part is, is a part of being emotionally available. Yeah. 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 I mean, vulnerability is opening yourself up 
to get hurt, basically, right? In the hopes that you won't. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you hold back parts of yourself that either you learn growing up that if you shared these, you would get hurt. Um, there has to come a point where, you know, if you want to access deeper emotional connection with someone, then you do have to open up and you do have to be vulnerable and you do have to risk getting hurt. Right. So I don't think you can open up to deep, deep love without also opening up to deep, deep pain. And that's a choice that you have to make. Right. And that's why a lot of people don't open up and they aren't vulnerable because they learn growing up that when they do this, they get hurt. Right. Someone makes fun of them. Someone minimizes their experience. Someone gaslights them. Someone uses that information to, you know, hold it, hold it against them at some later point. And, and it's too bad that people have had those experiences. And you know what that makes me think of? That makes me think of how some, a lot of breakups and divorces end so badly. And just how it's laser like town. you are just throwing all of the beauty that you had together out because you're no longer with that person. And now it's like, I still, I'm hurting and I just want to hurt them. Yeah. And it's coming out in such a very violent way because you're taking all those things you know about them, their heart and all your, like, and, and it's almost like their faults and all their mistakes they made, which is normal. We're all human. And it's like throwing it in their faces and it's so toxic. It's, that's really, and that's really scary when you think about people that have gone through a divorce like that or a breakup like that, that it was so incredibly painful beyond the breakout breaking of your heart because your heart's completely broken. Yeah, but then already. it's like that person is still wanting to hurt you in such violent ways. And it's like, then how do you step into a new relationship with an open heart? Yeah, really slowly. Yes. And, that, and that's why I counsel people to go slow, right? At the beginning. To, yes. This is how you figure out whether this is a safe person or a safe relationship and whether they're emotionally available and whether they can handle your disclosures with tender, loving care, right? Is you, you take baby steps towards it. Right. You share something that's vulnerable. Maybe you share about how you had a bad day and then how do they respond? Do they say, Oh, tell me about it. You know, I'd love to, or what can I do to help? How can I support you? Mm -hmm. Or do they say like, Oh, come on. You think you had a bad day? Like, yeah, be strong. Buck up. <laughs> yeah. Buck up. Like, at least you don't live in Ukraine. You're like, yeah, okay. I get it. That's bad. Mm. But th this is, this is what happened to me today. You know? So that's, a, that's these a really are little point. They're tests, right? Yeah. And, uh, they're, they're just, how do they respond? Mm -hmm. Do they respond in a way that is validating and kind and generous? Or do they minimize, make light of, right? Make fun of you. Um, pretend like it's not happening. Change the subject because they're just like too uncomfortable with uh, being in a supportive role. And so this is how you can identify what kind of person that you're dealing with. And this is how you can start to slowly trust that you're, you're probably not going to get hurt in the same way that you did with your last relationship. You probably get hurt differently. <laughs> yeah. Cause life, uh, yep. You never know, right? <laughs> you just never know. So you talk about the edge, how you say, don't let the fear strip you from exploring closer to your edge. What is yeah. your edge? Can you expand on that? For our yeah, your edge is, is the edge of your comfort zone, yeah. right? So if you never learn to open up, then your comfort zone is not opening up, right? So for you, mm -hmm. the edge is going to be to, you know, explore what does opening up a little bit look like? What does telling someone how I feel a little bit look like? What does it feel like, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, you know, we were talking about smoking cigarettes earlier. Um, this is before the recording, everybody. And, you know, for me and now. my experience, we don't <laughs> smoke now. No, we're either chewing gum or we're, we've kicked it completely. But uh, for me, you know, the fear of quitting was actually worse than actually quitting. Really? The, oh, yeah, because you're thinking oh, about all the things you're like, going to miss. I'm going to miss my morning coffee with the smoke. I'm going to miss like, right? What, what yeah. is it? What is it going through your head? Oh, it was just like, oh, this is going to be so painful. Not I'm going to miss. I'm going to, I'm just going to like scratch my yeah. eyes out. I'm going to be <laughs> yeah. a nightmare to everybody. I'm going to be anxious. 
And then when I did quake, I was like, all right, it's not actually that bad. Like it's way, I made it way worse than I thought it, than, than it actually was. And that's sort of what can happen when we are, are scared of this next level of our development, right? When we're scared of exploring the edge of our comfort zone, when we're scared of exploring what does being vulnerable with a partner looks like, we sometimes make it way worse than it actually is. And you end up doing the thing, right? You have the disclosure. Let's say you share with someone that you have herpes and you think that they're going to banish you from their life. And instead they go like, oh my God, that must've been so, so hard. Like, tell me about it. Right. And you go, oh shit. Okay. That was actually, that was pretty sweet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's, that's the edge, right? That's, that's like not letting the fear stop you from exploring your, your growth, right? Your next zone of development. Yeah. So you, there, are, there are things you actually teach about getting over your fears. And you say, the opposite of fear is faith. Yeah. I learned yeah. that in 12-step recovery a long time ago. Oh, I've never heard of that before, that the opposite of fear is faith. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, you have to have some faith that what you're going to do, you, you will be okay. Yeah. Right? Yes. And the... What happens is the more you practice these tools, the more you practice opening up, the more you practice being more vulnerable, being more transparent, um, you find out that they didn't react the way you thought they were going to, right? Mm -hmm. They actually reacted positively. And if they don't, which will happen, then you have great information about how to move forward. You go, okay, you know what? This is like not the kind of support that I want. This is actually not supportive at all. So... Um, This isn't the kind of person that I want to be in a relationship with. But uh, on the flip side, hopefully they respond positively. And then you have more data, right, to support the fact that if I do this again, hey, you know what? It's still scary. I It's still scary to tell someone that I have herpes, but the last two times I did it, no one kicked me out of bed. Yeah. Still got laid, actually. So maybe I can trust and have some faith that – uh, it'll also happen like this again, mm-hmm. right? So, so the faith kind of takes over for the fear. And, you know, courage isn't like the absence of fear. It's like doing the thing scared. Yes. Oh, exactly. That is, it, yep. You can't just it's, wait for the fear also, to go away. Yeah. I, I love, I, like, I have this image in my mind when I think of courage. And we're going to have my, oh, maybe I won't say it, but... <laughs> I think of courage as a muscle and the more we work that muscle, the stronger it gets. And it's like, you're not, you're not ever going to be, your life is always going to be full of fear. That's, and that's completely natural where we have fear for a very good reason to keep us alive, right? And to protect ourselves and our, and our others around us. We love, but, um, I also think that a lot of times it's irrational. It's like, that doesn't, you know, you just have to, you still have to work through it. So you, but they want, the second thing you say about getting over our fears is um, stop reading the stories, stop telling the stories. No, like, no. are you, are you, when you say that, you're talking about like, you know, figuring out what you're actually thinking about, which is like oftentimes a narrative, right? Like you said, yeah. you think all these stories up about how your partner or that person you're with is going to react, and you create all these stories, this drama in your head about. He might say this, she might say that. Okay, then I'm going to have to say this. Like you, you created all this dialogue and all these assumptions. So stop telling the stories. How do you, well, we, maybe we can't stop it, but we can mute it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could stop reading the story. Uh, I, first of all, I just want to say that I love the fact that you have like all access to the course materials because I'm like, what did what did I say? And then you yeah. tell me what I said. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. I, mean, yeah. I haven't, you know, I haven't I taught the course you in a memorize. while. You created it, but hey. <laughs> so the, the stories thing is, is I, I do think we can stop. Yeah. So we all have like this library of stories that we, we pick up all the time. You know, I'm not good enough. I am never going to make enough money. Um, I'm never going to be in a relationship. I'm too, uh, you know, uh, ugly or unattractive to have the kind of relationship that I want. No one wants to be with me. It's all these stories that we tell ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And for, for the most part, they are stories that we've made up, you know, And, and sometimes they, they are born from someone saying you're not good enough, usually like a caretaker or something. And you take that as like, gospel, just truth. And it's not, it's just another human being doing the best they can messing up. And, 
you know, we take that as gospel and we hold on to it. And, and these are self-limiting stories. These are not helpful at all. Right. So each of these stories is a book in your library. I'm never going to find love. I'm not good enough. Mm-hmm. Um, no one's ever going to love me. You know, sort of, these are like the classics. <laughs> yeah. And every time you take that story, you, you like pull the book off the shelf and you start reading it. Right. And, and it really is up to you to just not do that. Right. To like say, oh, you know what? That book no longer serves me. I'd prefer the book that is, that's titled, I'm good enough, but gosh darn it, dating is hard. Yes. Or relationships (laughs) are complicated, but I'll give it my best shot. Or plenty of people love me just the way I am, belly and all, you know, like much more accurate titles. And if you think about meditation, right? Like, the idea of these stories of us having to let them go is that we have to practice letting go and letting go is like kind of nebulous. It's hard to describe. People are just like, well, how do I let go? Like everyone's telling me to just let go, you know, how do I let go? (laughs) And uh, you have to think of it in, in terms of meditation, right? So if you've done any mindfulness meditation, you know that, uh, you know, sort of there's an object to meditation, right? Which is usually the breath, because it, because it just happens and you can focus on it. So there has to be an object of meditation. And what happens during meditation is that uh, like clouds, a thought will come into your purview, mm-hmm. right? Into your space. And you can grab hold of that cloud and just explore it and stop thinking or focusing on the breath. And then you're just lost in that thought. And what you learn in meditation is to let go of that thought and go back to the breath. Right. And so this, this strategy is the same for letting go of these stories, right? The story pops up. I'm not good enough. You choose to pick up the book and read it or to put it away and pick up a different book and say, Oh wait, no, that book sucks. I'd much rather pick up. I'm good enough. And dating is hard. So that's sort of how I look at these stories and how to let go of them and how to even create new stories for yourself that are much more accurate than these like antiquated stories that we've been holding on to for a long time. Yeah. And something you also say, which, I mean, I know you do talk about very openly about the fact that you've had therapy over the years, right? I've got a regular therapist and thank goodness. But you know, that's the thing is like, let's just say this fear is really ruling your beliefs. And you know, you've tried meditation, you're reading all the books, you're listening to all the podcasts, right? <laughs> but in the end of the day, it's like your ability to really relate with somebody on the level you want to, and is um, you, you just aren't able to do it by yourself. You do need, you may need therapy, and there's zero shame around that. Oh yeah, you probably need therapy. I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody. Most of if, us do. If, like all of us do. Why not? <laughs> I, I'd say. I'd say all. I mean. Uh, yeah. You know, unfortunately, it's just not as accessible, no. especially in the, in the United States and, and, and more accessible in Canada, but still not something that gets, that's paid for through healthcare for the most part. Sometimes it is. If you're lucky and you've got a great healthcare system or a great healthcare plan, then sometimes it is. But, um, yeah, you sort of hit it on the, on, on the head, which is that oftentimes these relationships that we have with our therapists are sort of the, the, the relationships that we wish we had growing up or the wish we have right now. So to a certain degree, some of these therapists are going to repair at you, right? They're going to talk to you in the way that you wish your, your caretakers, your father, your mother talked to you when you were growing up or the way um, you could interact with your partner or your friends or whatever. So they, they act as a stand in, but then also they're trained in, in figuring out, you know, why are these, why do you act the way you do? Like what, how do these stories make sense for you? Right. How do these behaviors, these patterns make sense for you? And yeah, I've been a a huge fan of therapy for, I think I've been with my current therapist for four years now, almost five years. We, We talk nearly on it on a weekly basis and there's just always stuff to explore. Right. Absolutely. Stuff comes up, stuff comes up. And even when I think I go, I think I'm good for like a month. Like, let's just check in in a month. And then I'll be like, oh man, I really wish I could run this by her and see what, what's going on. And, but I, I've also been really lucky to have the two therapists that I've worked with in my life were just fantastic. You know, I got yeah. really, really lucky, never interviewed therapists, just kind of showed up and go, okay, you're my therapist now. Let's go, let's get to work. You know? Yeah. A big fan. So I've got a question from our community about this, about being in a relationship while you're in therapy. I'm a 31-year-old single female, and due to depression, low self-esteem, 
I, and my past, I find it difficult to get emotionally close to people in general. And I find it very difficult to be emotionally available in romantic relationships. I'm currently in therapy for my mental health issues and it's going well. But I'd like to ask for general advice on how to make yourself emotionally available in a romantic relationship. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, first of all, it's beautiful that you're doing the work and that you're getting support for, for you know, the mental health that you're struggling with. And, um, I mean, it, it all goes back to starting small, right? We don't just show up and sort of, you know, open up fully hoping we don't get hurt because that is a good recipe for getting hurt, really hurt, right? We start slow and we, we share with people, um, I mean, I think a good way to start would be to talk about, you know, the relationship, right? So tell your partner, hey, I'd love to spend some time this evening to talk about our relationship, which is yes. like pretty scary. You know, that is like not something that people do. Usually you hear that when mm -hmm. you're, you're, someone's about to break up with someone. Or if you've got so a you big issue that you need to work on. Yeah, a big issue. Yeah. I, I'd much rather you, you bring this up uh, on a regular basis yeah. Hey, let's have a check in about our relationship. How are we doing? Are you enjoying this? What do you love about this? What, um, what could be different? What could be better? You know, how can I be a better partner to you? Um, so I think that could be a nice little baby step, right? Mm -hmm. With the caveat of saying like, Hey, nothing is wrong. I just want to practice being a little bit more open with you about, you know, how we're doing and how I feel about you. So that'd be one good step. Um, Another one is to, is to share with people, you know, like what you want and need, right? And also to share with people, there's actually a really great practice um, in some of the more like tantric circles called desires, fears, and boundaries. And it, it serves as a way to create a container for a sexual experience that feels safe and exciting and fulfilling, where you both take turns sharing what is your desire, your fear, and your boundaries around this encounter, and it's a really beautiful, intimate practice that really lets people into what you're wanting, what you're scared of, and, and what you absolutely do not want. But it doesn't have to be just for sex, right? This could be for anything. This is, this is what I want. This is what I'm scared of, right? You don't really need the, the boundary there unless there's a boundary discussion that has to happen because there's some sort of hurtful or unwanted behavior that's, you know, that, has, that you've experienced. So sharing your desires and your fears, Hey, I'm scared that if I open up to you, um, you're not going to like what you see and you're going to leave. Yes. And I've had a lot of relationships growing up where people left and my mom left when I was younger. And so I have sort of this, this fear, you know, that it's a pattern and it's something that I, you know, w would like to change. Mm. So it could be, could be a kind of practice like that as well. I would just, I really appreciate all that. And just the, the approach, Sean, because when you show up that way and it is very honest and vulnerable, it invites the other person to just react in the same way. It, it opens yeah. people's hearts because it's just like, you're coming at this like, wow, like I'm so, whoa, I'm impressed. And I'm proud of you for actually opening up. And I really appreciate knowing that this is what's going through your heart and your mind. And it invites somebody else to do the same. Yeah. And they, and they might be like, yeah, I'm so not down to do that. Yeah. And you're like, okay, wow. Like, ouch. And yeah. Might so, need to reconsider what's going on. Yeah. Here. So, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about how do you identify if someone's emotionally unavailable? I mean, a couple key pieces is like when you disclose something that's intimate and vulnerable, how do they react and do they make light of, right? As in, do they make fun of you or do they minimize it? You know, that's not really that big of a deal. Or uh, do they change the subject? Mm -hmm. right? Do they avoid any sort of questions of any sort of intimate nature? Like, Oh, how was your childhood? Like, you're like, Hey, what do you want to do tonight? You know, it's like, what just happened there? I just <laughs> asked a question, you know, you can't answer that question with a question. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're not ready to talk about your childhood, you could be like, yeah. look, you know, I, I, that's not really something I'm ready to talk about, but I could definitely talk about that at some point. Right. So like if you, someone asks you these questions and you're not ready because you're, you don't know them, it's totally, instead of changing the subject, you could say, uh, thank you for asking. I'm not ready to talk about that. But when I am, I'll let you know. Yeah. That's a gentle right? so way to are... say, that's a gentle way to say it. And it's very direct. And you're recognizing that they asked. Yes. And you're choosing not to answer, right? So um, 
changing the subject is a big one. Um, making fun of you when you open up is a, is a huge one, right? Gaslighting you is, is, you know, there aren't a lot of red flags, but that, that would be one of them. Right. And so, so for, can you give an example yeah. of that? Like, let's just say, um, yeah, please give an example of gaslighting in a conversation. Wait, you give me an example of gaslighting. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's just say that, um, okay. Good, ex- good example was, Oh, well, it's tough. I know it is really tough, <clears throat> but really what gaslighting is, it's like you are coming to somebody with a concern or something that you're not happy with. You didn't feel that went down the right, the right way. I felt really hurt. And the person is flipping it on you. Like, well, if you wouldn't have done that, that's why I acted that way. Yeah. Something like that. Well, or it, that didn't happen. Oh, that didn't know? happen. Yeah. Like, no, I wasn't, I, 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 uh, I called you back. I did call you back. I was oh, like, yes. no, you didn't. You know, like, yeah, you I call definitely called you back. I've got a call display, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hello. Yes. Yeah. So, so minimizing, so, it's like actually negating someone's emotional experience or yeah. bid for connection or, uh, some sort of challenge that they're bringing up and just saying like that didn't happen or flipping it around and making it about them. And, uh, if you do this enough, then you actually start to believe that it's true, right? So I think I had a girlfriend who would say that I was really dramatic and that I was, uh, that my needs were out of control and that I was too needy, right? So if you, if you tell your partner that they're too needy enough, there's a point where they might start to believe it yeah, and think that they're actually the problem when, when really the issue is that um, their partner is in, unavailable or unable to meet their needs. And so instead hmm. of saying, Hey, I really can't do that for you. They turn it around and say, you're actually really needy. And it's like pretty, it's like a huge turnoff. Wow. What a, what a great example that is. Now we got, it, it took us a little while. But we got the example. No, I love it. And the, the other thing you say about emotionally, um, emotional unavailability, which I think is very important is people can talk, 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 talk. But if you're not walking the walk, like if your words are not aligned with your actions, what's the point, right? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a big red, that's a big red flag. It's, that really is a good indicator if they say one thing and do another. Yeah, or yeah, people, yeah, it's funny. People like On to a say regular like, basis, well, let's just say. <laughs> actions speak louder than words. And, and I go, sure, but I'd much rather have those actions and those words line up on a regular basis. Yes. That's the gold standard right there. Yeah. And the other thing you, you talk about is acting differently around you than other people. It's oh, like, yeah. they're all nicey, nicey. Well, actually I, I can't think of an example right now of how that would show up. It's almost well, if, they, like, if they were like really sweet to you in behind closed doors and then sort of like in public, yeah, you, don't like exist. you don't exist. Yeah. Or, or like don't treat you the same way. Yeah. Um, that would be something that I would, I would look out for. Big time. So one of the community questions around this is my partner and I often get into arguments because she says I'm emotionally distant or unavailable. So this person wants to fix it, but I don't know how. Yeah. Perfect. Advice? Ask your partner. Yes, oh yes, ask exactly. Your oh, that's a great, great answer, Sean. <laughs> like simply ask your partner, what can I do to show up for you in the way that you need? Would you say yeah, or like what that? am I doing for, yeah. Or like, yes. And, uh, you know, wh- what am I doing right now that leads you to think that I'm emotionally distant? Like, what are these behaviors that you're cluing in on so that I can, and then what can I do differently? Right. Yes. What can I do differently? This is such a basic question. Like how can I show up for you in a more emotionally present way? What, what does, I mean, one of my favorite questions is like, you know, if someone says like, Hey, I need you to be more present. It's like, okay, well, what does presence mean to you? Yes. What does, what does being more present look like? What does it actually look like for you? We don't, you know, we, we, there's, there is shared language, but oftentimes some of the, the meanings mean something totally different. Like if I say, Hey, look, Robin, I need some space. And you're like, fine, whatever. I'll see you in two weeks. And I was yeah. like, no, I actually just need you to like move, like, <laughs> Go to the other room or you're like, you're too close to me on the couch. And very, being very, um, like, what is it? That you're, what space are you talking about right now? Yeah. What does space look like for you? That's like my favorite question. You know, what, what does emotional distance look like for you? How could I be, become more present and more available? Mm. I mean, the person that wants you to change has the answers for the most part, yes. right? Oh, Just a- ask them, but we don't, we don't ask 
we assume we go to the worst case scenario always we um we we don't want to look weak by by saying like what can i do differently we don't want to think that we're doing anything wrong right so there's all these barriers in the way that a lot of them can just be like kicked up, kicked aside by just saying like okay let's talk about this like what can i how can i help how can i be supportive what can i do what can you do here's what you can do um and and it does require putting the defensiveness the defensiveness aside yes that's, right? I for think the that's most a hard part, word for for a lot of us me yeah, included I, i'm definitely defensive right from the get go and then i soften and i'm like okay <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> I mean, it's hard. It's hard for some, you know, for us to think that we're not doing something right, that we're actively hurting somebody else. And but, you know, at the end of the day, the reality is, uh, if if this is someone that you care about, whether it's a family, a friend, or a partner, um, they are having this conversation with you because they want to keep you in their life. Yeah. Because if they didn't, they would just tell you to fuck off. Yeah. So they they actually like you enough to have this conversation. Mm-hmm. And. We're all doing the best we can. And sometimes our best is not that great. Like I recently, I've just not been a great friend because I've been in my house, not reaching out to anybody. I'm not asking people how they're doing. I'm just like worried about fucking doorknobs. If you could tell there's no doorknob, everybody on that door, because I got no doorknobs. So uh, I haven't really been a great friend and I'm doing the best I can. And that means that sometimes my best is not that great. And so we have to give each other and others that sort of grace as well Yes, for not being perfect. Yes. So I've got it. I wanted to talk about red flags because I think what I, what I, I, I did learn and I always learn from you, but what I did learn around this idea that red flags are often an opportunity to connect I thought this was really interesting. And I've got a community that. question that I wanted to frame around this so that we can talk about this concept. Yeah. So she's saying, I think that I'm quite an emotionally well-rounded person. I'm always looking for ways to improve and grow, and I feel like I'm in a great space to meet someone. I recently had a date with a man that was overall a great first date, which I often don't come across. However, one red flag came up for me. When discussing his past relationship, which he brought up, he casually mentioned that he had been to both counseling regarding control issues and that his ex accused him of having an anger management course. He took an anger management course. I didn't ask him much about it at the time because I was caught off guard and it felt really heavy for the first date. (laughs) I'm wondering whether I should see him again because that's a pretty big red flag, right? But he seemed like a nice guy, and I'd hate to use his honesty against him. I'm not sure what to do. What would you advise? I mean, yeah, if if that's the thing, then and you had a great time, and he's a you know seemingly nice guy, then it can't really hurt to have another date and say, hey, look, you mentioned control issues, you mentioned anger management. You know, I would be doing myself a disservice if we didn't. (laughs) You know, touch on that a I little love the bit wording, before we kept John, going. Like, honest, like that's awesome. <laughs> that's a little business speak too. You know, that's how I talk to like customer service folks. Like, I'd be doing myself a disservice if I didn't bring up the fact that like that this service is really bad. No, <laughs> this is a bit of a red flag here. <laughs> customer experience is lacking. Um, yeah, you know, hey, I, you know, I'm my biggest advocate, and I'm, I'm going to advocate for myself here. I'd love to hear a little bit more about these control issues. Because here, here's the reality is that, yeah, maybe he's got control issues. Uh, you know, show me someone who doesn't actually. But mm-hmm. everybody's got That's control issues. That's a good point. It's like, but to what <laughs> level, you know? I got, I have control issues, but I'm also a nice person to be in a relationship with. Yes. Um, because I, I recognize, I'll be like, man, I'm feeling super controlling right now, you know? I, I try to control so, all my situations. It's like trying to figure out which option is, which, which is coming at me. How can I deal with that one right there? <laughs> Just controlling my life. We all have control. We all want control. Because because when you have control, yeah. you have a sem- semblance of like, you know, everything's going to be okay. But, uh, you know, it's possible that he has control issues. It's also possible that his dynamic with his ex. Yes was more controlling or his behavior was more controlling than it was with other people. You know, we show up so differently depending on who we're showing up. Yes. That is another great insight that you bring. 
So we don't know. Maybe maybe she was extra controlling, and and maybe maybe she was. You know, I don't want to throw her under the bus, but we can throw everybody under the bus because we don't know these people. Yeah. But maybe she was so shut down that his only way of getting her to respond was through anger, right? So maybe yeah. they had that like pursuer distance or dynamic yes. as well. But if you've got two pursuers. Well then, you know, there there probably won't be anger management issues. So I don't I don't really know. We don't know what's going on, but it's no. for sure worth a conversation. Then yes. that's why I say red flags are opportunities to connect, right? If you disconnect now without having that conversation, you will never know anything more about that situation or about you in relationship with this person. So, you know, unless some unless there's abuse towards you, unless there's like, you know, any form of abuse, really physical, sexual, or emotional, in, intellectual, or spiritual, um, then the red flags are really just a, an opportunity to have a conversation and get more clarity around a thing that you think is might be one way, but actually might be a different way. And, she, you know, it, he might have anger management issues, in which case, get a little clarity and then peace out. Yeah. I think that when we listen to you and other relationship coaches talk around red, identifying red flags it's almost like this is not black and white people like and what one person would like, think, think oh that's definitely a red flag walk away don't go on the second date i i love your approach on saying like no it, it may not be a red flag but something that you brought up was about like let's just say you show up on the first date and it, it didn't sound like you know he mentioned that he was in therapy sorry taking that course and that his ex talked about anger management but Let's say you show up and this person is always talking crap about their ex. You know, there's this idea like, okay, you, you can't just be pointing the finger on that other person. It, maybe it was a really, really, really bad relationship and that person that they were married to or with was really not great. But that could be a red flag that they're always talking. Oh. They're, not, they're not taking responsibility for their 50% of that. Well, I feel like it's wildly inappropriate to trash talk your ex on a first date. Oh, I, I agree. I completely to agree. Trash talking your ex at any, any point, really. Yeah. If it ended poorly, just say like, hey, you know what? We were like really incompatible in a few ways. Here are the few ways. And, and like, it was, it was a really tough situation. It was really painful. Yeah. I was, you know, I really, I really liked them or whatever. There are ways of, of being honest about what happened without trash talking. I mean, I feel like that's... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's just not somebody that I want to be, you know, continue to be in a relationship with. Yeah. Also, uh, the the anger management dude, I would I would be so curious, like, hey, what are what are they teaching you in this anger management course? Yes, I w- like, right? I- like <laughs> I want to know. Yeah. See how you could how it is an opportunity to connect, right? Like you could now learn what he's learning, and he might be like, hey, you know what? I with my ex, I was I was I was not great. I was not great. I, you know, our dynamic was that, that I was a bit of a yeller. And what I'm learning in this course is, uh, there, there's this sheet, it's a, it's called the feelings wheel and, uh, there's all these different <laughs> feelings. And now I'm better. I look at the wheel when I'm feeling something, I go, oh, shit, I'm, I'm, uh, intimidated, you know? So I've got a broader understanding of, of what's going on with me emotionally. Of course, this is like best case scenario of how he would respond. He might be like, oh, it's a bunch of bullshit. And then you could be like, all right, well, you know. Thanks for the second date. Thanks for the information. I'm going going the other direction here. (laughs) Yeah. I wanted to share a quote of of yours that I wrote down because I thought it was really beautiful. And then I want to hear about the new course that you've just launched. Cool. So you say, trust that you have what it takes to hold space for yourself, to open up emotionally with another, and to navigate the murky waters of your emotional landscape. (laughs) Trust that once, trust that others can do the same with themselves and can hold your precious heart the way it needs holding. Your precious heart. Yeah. Yeah, we're all a little bit more tender than uh, than maybe we admit admit to yeah. being. And yeah, there there is some trust required there. This is not. I mean, where do we learn this? Not in school. No relationship education. You know, our caretakers or. Just, you know, just trying to survive. Uh, so, you know, that does require a lot of trust. Yeah. And I do want another plug. I want to do another plug for therapy because I think if people yeah. are, are, if they are able 
um, and willing to meet with somebody on a regular basis, a professional, that can help you reflect back what's going on and give you some tools to, to be more emotionally available with your partner and with yourself, then that's just a gift for being better in relationship. Yeah, I, you know, um, therapy, I read this passage once in the, as a footnote in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that says that basically therapy is, uh, allows you to sort of fertilize the soil so that what's inside of you can flower right? Prepare the soil actually for what, what's inside mm-hmm. of you that can flower. So oh, therapy good. is really there to help you like sort of be the best version of yourself to grow yeah. in like a really beautiful way. Um, it doesn't have to be as scary as you make it out to be. It's not like quitting smoking, you know, <laughs> generally it's a safe space for you to explore. It's actually a great space for you to explore a lot of these, you know, how to be more vulnerable. That's sort of their job. Yeah. So tell us about your new course, the love Collective. I love, I love how the um, acronym is TLC. Yeah. The love collective is a love cult. Um, it's a 12 week program. I'm super excited about it. I started it because, uh, when I put up a Q and a box on Instagram, I get like thousands of questions. Yes. Wow. And so, so I, I love doing Q and a, I love dialoguing with people. I love having a large group discussion and breakout groups. And so I wanted to create a container which is a 12 week program where we can explore 12 different themes around love Mm -hmm. and relationships and dating and sexuality, right? Healing from heartbreak, staying open, becoming emotionally available, getting your needs met. So it's sort of, uh, the best of all of my courses in these 12 weeks and every call has a theme and plenty of room for Q and a for large group discussion facilitated by me uh, this is really an opportunity for you to learn um, the things that have shaped the way I love and live my love life in a safe, loving, kind group environment. And uh, it's $349 US dollars, which is is less than an hour of coaching with me. Mm-hmm. And for that, you get 12 hours of group coaching, group training. Uh, you have access to an online community as well so that you can submit your questions anonymously if you don't feel comfortable sort of doing mini coaching with me uh, via video. And you have access to the, all the calls are recorded. So you can have, you'll have access to them for a year. You'll also, you'll have lifetime access to my Love Bird Club, which is my f- private Facebook group. Um, sort of a peer support group that is incredibly loving. Like I'm blown away by the level of support that, um, that folks show each other in that group. So that's, that's the thing. It starts, um, June 7th, it's three months and we meet once a week for 12 weeks. I'm really, really excited because this is a brand new format for me and I love creating new formats. And, um, I just really wanted an opportunity to interact with the folks in the group. The courses that I do, they're, they're sort of like one to many. I'm not, interacting with people as much because there, there isn't the format doesn't lend, lend itself well to it, but this is definitely like a, a, a more intimate cohort that I'm excited about. Yeah. Oh, it sounds amazing. Fantastic. Well, I live love training.com. That's the, Oh yes. Sorry. Live, live love training.com. And we'll make sure yeah, we put everything or, in the show notes for those of you that want to join June 7th. Yeah. Join the love cult. It's called join the, the love cult. The it's good. It's like a oxymoron, but it's all good. <laughs> no, there's, there's cults that are loving, right? I don't know. <laughs> Yours yeah, is. there's no malicious, no malicious stuff. There's no, you don't have to get a tattoo or anything. Yeah. Uh, it's all online. So, you know. The love cult tattoo is a heart. Hey, that's no no problem. <laughs> that's right. You can actually put one on there if you want. And, and... Thank you so much, Sean. I always, like, I just always have so much fun and learn so much and appreciate your time and our conversation. I'm super, super honored. This was really fun and beautiful. And it was thank super you for fun. having me. And enjoy all of all the sun and whatever whatever you're doing. And enjoy your unpacking and nesting in your new home. Thank you. Yeah. Next time there'll be art back here. Yeah. There's already a little bit over here. Well, I saw your dog. What's your dog's name again? Roger. Oh, Roger. I know Roger's such a like a beautiful companion of yours. So hi, Roger. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, he's so cute. Boy. Okay, Sean, well, take care. And so much love to you. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Please visit realloveready.com to become a member of our community. Submit your relationship questions for our podcast experts at reallovereadypodcast at gmail.com. We read everything you send. Be sure to rate and review this podcast. Your feedback helps us get you the relationship advice and guidance you need. The Real Love Ready podcast is recorded and edited by Maya Anstey. Transcriptions by otter.ai and edited by Maya Anstey. We at Real Love Ready acknowledge and express gratitude for the Coast Salish people, the stewards of the land on which we work and play, and encourage everyone listening to take a moment to acknowledge and express gratitude for those that have stewarded and continue to steward the land that you live on as well.